I'd love to invite any kids to come sit up on the stage with me. How you guys doing? Good. Doing good? I got an army today. This is awesome. You guys know what uh, you guys know what seasons are, right? Yes. Did you guys have a favorite season? What's your favorite season? Um, summer. 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 Spring. Spring. Summer. 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 Fall. Fall. Winter. Winter. Oh, I got a buddy. Cause you know what? What's your favorite season? Winter. Winter is my favorite season. I love the snow, but you know what else? I love that I don't have allergies. I am sneezing like crazy right now. Um, but you know what? There is something that I like about the spring very much. I thought about three things that I like about spring. I get to wear sandals a lot. I love to wear sandals. I almost wore them this morning. I get to, uh, I get to plant a garden. That's a lot of fun. And I love baseball. I love that baseball's back. I brought something with me this morning about this spring season, and I will just pass it around, but I brought two baseballs. What? And I want you to look at the baseball. So just look at them really quick, but try to pass them around and see what's different about each of them. You gotta do it quick, so everyone gets to see. These are two baseballs that I've had for uh, 10, 15, maybe 20 years, and they're kind of the same, but they're kind of different too. So let's get them passed over this way now so these guys can see. But as you guys are, are seeing them, what's different between the two balls? Tell me something that's different. That one has more signatures on this one. That one has more signatures, yeah. So you can see all the signatures. There's a lot of signatures on this one. There's how many signatures on this one? one. one. Just one, right? Anything else that you see that's different? It's a little lighter, okay. And this one's a little whiter. It's a little cleaner looking, right? Yeah. Um, can I tell you a little bit about the story behind both of these two baseballs that I have? Yeah. The, uh, the one that's got all the names on it, I bought that. I was at a Twins game like 15 years ago. I bought that at the gift shop. It was like $8, and it came with like 20 names of different players on it. And I thought that's a pretty cool souvenir. The other ball, though, I was down in Florida like at spring training like probably 15 years ago. And it was like before one of the games, and I was walking around, and I ran into this guy, and I'm like, wait, you're Tom Kelly. He was the manager at the Twins, so I had this souvenir ball, and I was like, would you sign it? And he signed the ball for me. And I've, I've hung on to both of these balls. I've got a couple other baseballs at home, one that I caught at a game, and another one that means something special to me, too. But when you think about these two baseballs that I've got here right now, which one do you think means more to me? Which one's more special? Oh, I got... Fingers pointing at a little bit of both, but those of you that are pointing to the one with Tom Kelly's name on it, this one to me is more special. Why do you think this one's more special? Because I got to see the person. Yeah, because I got to see the person who wrote his name on it. Yeah, I met this guy, and even though it was really quick, I met him, and that means a lot more to me than somebody who had just somebody put a stamp of all their names on the ball. I want to just. I just want to get you guys to think a little bit about something with Jesus, though. Um, the ball that I have that is real, that's like I met that person in real, I, I, want you to, I want you to think about Jesus for just a little bit. And in Matthew chapter 7, the Bible, it tells us something really, really important about Jesus. And Jesus, he had just finished teaching a group of people, and right after he finished teaching them, uh, there's a group of people that are just amazed at all the things that they saw and all the things that they heard about Jesus. And this is what verse 28 says. It says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. The people, they were amazed at who Jesus was because Jesus was real. He was incredibly real to them. And that's what I hope that you guys will keep knowing and keep learning and keep hearing about over and over again about a real Jesus who wants to know each one of us. So let's pray, and let's ask God to help us to know how real he is. Dear God, I thank you for each of these kids that are here this morning. I thank you that you want to know us, uh, you want to know us for real. You want to know uh, each of us, our ins, our outs, all the things going on, uh, and that you are real. I thank you that we can sing about you, that we can pray to you, that we can talk to you, that we can know you. Help us to understand you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, you guys. You guys can go back to your families.
Uh, as we said earlier, Pastor Paul Larson is our synodical president, and he's with us here this morning. And I probably have known Paul from a distance for, I hate to admit, like almost 20-some-odd years. I'm that old. Uh, it was the early 90s. I was a youth pastor in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Uh, I'd seen Paul at synodical stuff. I never really got to know him. Uh, it's really only the last year that I've really known him at all and gotten to see him. He's uh, was the pastor in Eau Claire, uh, Wisconsin. I almost said Eau Claire, Minnesota, sorry. Eau Claire, Wisconsin for, what's it, 12, 13 years? And uh, just this past summer in August, he was elected as our synodical president. I know he has had kind of a whirlwind uh, past uh, eight, nine months of traveling uh, all across the country, meeting lots and lots of people, and uh, we just want to welcome him here this morning as he brings God's message to us. So please join me in welcoming Pastor Larson. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Appreciate it, man. <clears throat> Good morning, Word of Life, Lesseur. I, uh, I have to tell you that your town is kind of a uh, mythological place for me. When I was a little boy going to Inspiration Point Camp, uh, I was from Clearbrook, Minnesota. That's where I, I grew up, north of uh, Fergus Falls, a couple of hours. And I always meet these kids from Lesseur, and I, and I thought... You know, I, I couldn't pronounce the name. I probably still can't pronounce the name uh, right. And I think it's humorous that I grew up in a place called Clearbrook in the county of Clearwater, and God eventually put me in a church in Eau Claire, all in meaning Clearwater uh, for some reason. But I've been working on pronunciation of French uh, 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 community names, but I have heard uh, for uh, decades uh, things about this church and this place. It's my first time being here, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, today. As Pastor Ed was saying, I have been traveling uh, a, a lot. One of the things that I, I came uh, into this new position with was a desire to be out and, and uh, meet our people and meet our churches to know them and for them to know me. And uh, I am uh, I'm both energized uh, for this new role that I have. I'm greatly humbled by it. I don't feel qualified at all. Uh, and I would ask your prayers uh, I am enthused about the Church of the Lutheran Brethren. I think we have a gift to share, and uh, I hope we can get to know each other better. I, I would love uh, uh, to know you and your church story better and convey who you are to the rest of your church family. As I'm traveling around, uh, one of the, uh, I, I guess just a, a few words about that. We'll share more about that in the Sunday School Hour. But I've been very encouraged just to hear. It's just great to hear what God is doing in different places. And I think sometimes we get really isolated in our local churches where we feel like we only know what's happening right around us and have no idea what we are uh, connected uh, uh, to. But as a, as a church body, the Lutheran Brethren, really, uh, we are a, a congregational form of government. And in one regard, uh, my position is not very authoritative at all. It's, it's all relationship uh, and influence. And, and uh, I'm going out telling churches that basically I am you. I represent a, a you, whether you know it or not. Uh, or claim me, I claim you because you're, you're the only identity I have. You put me into this place uh, where I am. I, I want to be a good, I want to represent you well to the other churches. I want to tell your story. Uh, and I'd also say that you are, you are us. Uh, you are part of a larger family. One of my favorite verses is Colossians 1 6 that says, All over the world the gospel is growing and bearing fruit. And I think it's just important, uh, oftentimes, uh, to step back and say, you know, it's not just what God is doing in my neighborhood. It's that I am part of this church that is moving and growing and bearing fruit across the world. Sometimes in my local neighborhood, we're just kind of hanging on. We don't see exactly what God's doing. Sometimes we see incredible places where it's growing right around us, where the gospel is bearing fruit around us. Uh, and, and one of the things, the privileges I have uh, is to be able to let you know that you are connected to what's happening in New Jersey and what's happening in Washington, what's happening in Chad, Africa. And uh, I want them to know the same uh, about you. Well, uh, the message today. There's a, a question that I think gets batted around in Christianity. It gets batted around the church. Honestly, in our church body, it gets batted around too. And people think about it. It, it has to do with our relationship with God it has to do with people thinking about how our relationship got with God starts and how it continues. And we kind of debate it and we stroke our chins about it. We sometimes argue about it. And it's phrased in different ways. But basically that question is, how can a person, how can we, how can you and I accept God? 
What's the nature of how we go, come to that place of conversion and, and what are our words and what's in our heart? How can we accept God? And, and I get that question, but I'm coming to think that there is a better question for us to ask, a deeper question for us to ask. And actually, if we're honest with ourselves, it's the question that really is resting on the hearts of the people outside of the walls of Word of Life Church. They're usually not asking the question, how can I, how can people accept God? The deeper, the bigger question really is, how can God accept me? How can God accept me? I think God answers that question in what might be a familiar text to many of you. I love this text. Uh, I quote this text every time I am part of a baptism of a little baby. But it, it's not just talking about that. It's, it's a text for us as well, for, for uh, uh, older people. It's Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. If you have your Bibles, I, I'd ask you to, to open uh, them. Uh, in today's day, uh, sometimes I have to say, please open your phones uh, to, to Mark chapter 10, whatever works uh, for you. But uh, some of the verse will be up on the wall here uh, as well. But would love for you to, to have your Bibles open, make some marks uh, in it, if you will. Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, and he put his hands on them, and he blessed them. Lord God, these are your words uh, to us today. Uh, they are, are, are words that your spirit lives within. They are, they are words that your spirit inspired. They are words that you, Lord Jesus, spoke yourself. And, and they are strong words. They even are hard words. They tell us uh, of ways in which we try to qualify that we can never qualify in your eyes. They, they are words that bring us to the end of ourselves and, and, and tell us that in our very best, highest, smartest, greatest standing, we're not acceptable. These are hard words. And yet, Lord God, at the same time, these are good words. And they are grace words. And they tell us of a, of a, of a gospel, of a good news, of a way that you have created for people to be right with you that rests not on that question, how can I accept God? But God, how can you accept me? Lord Jesus, I pray for, for each person uh, in this room today, uh, whether they are a, a little child, whether they are an elder saint, that at the end of the day, you would teach and show us how you can accept us and see ourselves as one of your children. We pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, the Larson family, my family, is uh, on the largish uh, size. I've got five kids. Uh, they're not little anymore. They range uh, from 22 uh, to 15. We go boy, girl, boy, girl, boy. I uh, had five kids in six and a half years. Yeah, we, life was busy uh, uh, back when. Uh, and all of our kids were born in Southern California. Before I was a pastor in Eau Claire, I was a pastor. Uh, B, my wife B and I, uh, were in Fullerton, California. And we lived about 10 minutes from Disneyland, and we lived about 10 minutes from Knott's Berry Farm. How cool is that? And every Christmas, we would take Grandpa and Grandma money, uh, uh, gifts for Christmas, and we'd convert them into annual passes for the family at either one theme park or, or another. And, and something you, you probably should know that I, I should tell you that in the Larson family roller coaster riding is like a sacred rite of passage as soon as a Larson kid was big enough to ride a roller coaster if it was at Knott's Berry Farm you know Ghost Rider if it was at, at Disneyland it was Space Mountain or whatever you have what's probably the closest here is uh Valley Fair is that Mark is that where you haul people off to uh, often what's the what's the big uh roller coaster there Wild thing. I've ridden that one. Yeah. 
Mark, your voice has changed over the years, I know. <laughs> Still a little child, right back, back, back there. But in our family, it's like a sacred rite of passage. And you know on these rides, there's always some, there's some, yeah, this is me. And it, when I'm, the reason for the picture, no, you can go back to the picture before me. They're, they usually have outside of the roller coasters this arm, this bar that sticks out on a sign. You know what I'm talking about? It, it's kind of a sign that you have to be at a certain height before they'll let you on on the, on the ride. It's a, it's a sign of a kind of a minimum requirement that you've got to be this big in order to get on this line, uh, on this ride. And sometimes it's 46 inches, 42, 48, 52, or whatever. The humorous thing to me is when my kids were little, as soon as it seemed like they were even getting close to being able to ride Ghost Rider or Space Mountain, it's like, okay, Nick, put on your brother's cowboy boots, you know, put on an extra pair of socks or two or stuff, you know, toilet paper in your boots, whatever. And then you know how you come up to that sign, and, and you have all done this, when you're trying to meet the kind of the minimum restriction or the minimum requirement for something, you know how you stand up, you just don't stand like this, but how people learn to stand as tall as they possibly can. Can, 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 can you picture it in your mind? You know, like a little kid kind of doing like this. All of you have tried to be a little taller than you are at some point, haven't you? And it was like that for us. And, you know, you, can you measure up to that bar just so that you meet the minimum requirement to be able to get on that ride? And it leads me to think that there are so many things in our world that have these minimum requirements, these minimum restrictions. You know, the, the ways that our world limit little people from big people stuff. And so, for example... There is a minimum age restriction. Thank goodness, I'm, I'm really grateful for that, that you don't have a driver's license yet. Not you specifically, anybody. Aren't you glad that we have a minimum age restriction for driving? I am. It makes me feel a little safer. There's a minimum height restriction, usually to go off the high dive in, in the pool. There's a, there's a minimum weight uh, restriction to be exempt from seat, sitting in a car seat any longer. There are minimum grades that you have to have to get into certain institutions into certain universities. There's a minimum education level that you have to have to hold a certain job. There's a minimum skill level that you have to have before they'll let you swim in the deep end of the pool. There's a certain minimum strength level that you have to have to, to make a team, to make the cut. For the Minnesota Twins, that, that level is very low, Mark. I, very, 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 very low. I am a dyed in the well. I, I am a true Blue Twins and Vikings fan who has been living in exile for 12 years. <laughs> I'm with you, brother. You know, being a, being a Minnesota sports fan teaches character, I think. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is going to cause the sermon to go two, two minutes further, but I used to have young, this is not in my notes at all. I used to have young couples come to me for marriage, not marriage, uh, premarital counseling in Eau Claire. And we were close enough to the border that probably one in three couples had a Viking fan and a Packer fan. And it was always like the, the young girl Packer fan was like, everything's perfect about him, but he's a Viking fan. Could, couldn't, you, couldn't you convince him to become a Packer fan? I said, why in the world would you want me to do that? I mean, if you want a sign of faithfulness, of someone long-suffering to, <laughs> to stick with a commitment... Okay, back to my notes. All of these minimum restrictions, these minimum requirements say to little people, you're not old enough, you're not big enough, you're not smart enough, you don't measure up high enough. All these ways that our world says to little ones, you don't yet qualify. But there was this one other ride out in Southern California. It was at Knott's Berry Farm. Um, there was something very unique about this ride. It had a, it had a bar out front also. It was, uh, go to the next slide, uh, please. It was this ride, it was called Speedway. And I don't know if you've ever been to Knott's Berry Farm or I know they've got Camp Snoopy. I don't think they have Speedway uh, there. It's related, uh, uh, same family of theme parks. But Speedway had a qualification also, but the qualification was different. Do you know where I'm going with this? Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm predictable, aren't I? Speedway had this, this sign, this bar out front. 
in order to ride this ride speedway, you had to be smaller than. You had to be less than. It had a maximum restriction, not a minimum one. And the thing that I thought was really cool about this ride for little kids, you had to be under that line, this pretty low line in order to ride. But the really cool thing is this. If, if you as a little kid went on that ride, go to the next picture, I love this, you could bring a big person with you. I, I think that was great. In many ways, our text today, I think, is, is like that. There, there is something about this text that we've read that tells us, you know what, in God's economy of things, his bar is, is way here, and, and only little ones, really little ones, qualify, and big people who will be like them. I love that. Behind this text that we have in front of us today is a very great question. It's a question that stirs the heart and troubles the mind, I think, of any honest person, and that is, how can God accept someone like me? It's not, how do I find the right words? How do I muster myself up? How do I make myself good enough to, to be right with God in my own Said, How can I accept? It's, how can God Accept me. What are the qualifications? What are the restrictions that make a person or keep a person from being right with God now and forever? I have a very simple path through our text today. It's not a very uh, impressive outline for your new president. I'll show that I'm, I'm a simple guy. But, but my path through this story is just really a, a two point sermon. And the first point is this story tells us what children are like in the eyes of Jesus. You might guess what my second point is because it's pretty closely related. But first of all, this story tells us what children are like in the eyes of Jesus. The first obvious thing we see about children, even little babies, is simply that Jesus has room for them. Jesus has time for them. Jesus has heart for them. And by the way, in this story in Mark chapter 10, we're talking about little children, I, I hear. Both Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell this story of the little children brought to Jesus. In Matthew and Mark, the word used to describe children is kind of a generic term for little ch children, paideia. And, and, it, and, it, and it means a little child, but it's not very specific. I think it's, it's curious that in Luke's version of telling this story, he uses a more specific word, a more narrow defining word, the word brefe, and that literally means infant. It means babies. I think the literal meaning of the word brefe is even suckling. We're talking about a very small child, or at least some of them were very small children brought to Jesus. You know, I, I have never uh, exactly been a little kid, kind of a, a baby uh, kind of guy. You know, some, some men are just really good with, with babies, and I have never really thought uh, of myself to, to, to be that. I mean, I love my own five kids when they were in babies, but if you've got a little baby, you know, I've, I've never really thought like, oh, there's a little baby, let me go hold it, let me go change its diaper. I just, you, you take... Until I can coach him in Little League Baseball, you just hang on to him. But here's this 30-year-old, 30-some-year-old man, Jesus. And isn't there something pretty winsome about this 30-year-old something young man to see the eagerness in his voice to be around little children? I will say that at my age, now I'm not that old, I'm 52, but my oldest kid is 22, that... I'm starting to, to find that I'm being transitioned to wanting to be around little kids. I'll, I'll be in a room like this. Oh, there's a baby over there. I think it's just God preparing me for grandparenthood at, at some time. But here's Jesus as a 30-year-old man. And can you, can you hear the eagerness in Jesus' voice? Let the little children come to me. And I don't want to bore you here. But I, I love it even more because the verb form is something called an imperfect infinitive. And it doesn't just mean that Jesus goes over there, looks, says a, a, sees a kid and says, let, the, let that little kid come to me. And, and imperfect infinitive, literally it means, Jesus is saying, let the little children ever be coming to me. Always, anytime. Let the little children. I want them. All the time, every one of them, there's this sense of this continual eagerness in Jesus' heart. Let the little children ever be coming to me. Why? 
Is, is Jesus saying that because, oh, I love little children because they're so cute and lily white innocent and they're never smelly? Is that what he's saying? No. Is he just a sentimental guy? No, I don't think that's the reason for it. It says that Jesus blesses them. The word is eulageo, and it, and it means to speak good over them. And you know why? Because they needed to be blessed. They were lacking something. Jesus speaks of even little children needing to receive the kingdom of God. Jesus' interest in little children is not because they are lily white innocent by themselves. He sees them as needy creatures who need to be blessed, who need to receive the kingdom of God. There's a truth here, subtle, but it needs to be said, and that is that the first trait of a child in Jesus' eyes is that it is needy. It is needy. Little children need Jesus. Little children are not born innocent. They're born under the curse of the fall, going all the way back to Adam and Eve. Eve they have a DNA stamped in their blood and their spirit that needs to be redeemed. Little children need Jesus. Now, we also see a child is, right alongside of needy, is helpless. In this story, did you notice little children don't come running to Jesus? Little children don't come hopping or skipping. Little children are brought to Jesus. They are totally dependent on others to be carried, to be fed, to be loved. Children in this story are the picture of abject dependency. Dependency. Little children don't pay for the things they get. They don't clothe themselves. They don't shelter themselves. They don't provide for their own. They don't approach Jesus of their own volition or their own energy. We talk about having a come to Jesus meeting, and you know what? These little ones can't do it. They aren't at the place where they can run to Jesus, walk to Jesus, jump, skip, hop to Jesus. You know, we, we, we uh, with little ones... Uh, Almost all of you, uh, you know, above a teenage year are either a parent or an uncle or an aunt or a cousin. You, you've seen little ones, but you know how we kind of mark the growing autonomy of a child? Those of you that are parents, what is the first sign you look for in a baby that it's starting its journey toward autonomy? It is when you have this little infant lying in the, in the cradle, and, and what's the first sign? It can roll over, right? That's usually the first sign. And then it can push itself up a little bit. And, and then after a, a, a while, it, it, it can get up and start to crawl. I shouldn't say it, he or she, can, can crawl. And, and then the next sign, is it can crawl across the room and maybe pull, it, pull himself or herself up against the coffee table. And then it can take its first toddling steps, and then she can walk across the room, and then she can kind of jump or, or, or run, kind of jog, might fall a little bit. And, and we have these marks of growing uh, uh, autonomy. But the thing in this story that I need to let you know is these little children can't do any of that. They have to be brought to Jesus. They're helpless. Here's another trait of children in this story. As Jesus sees children, they're needy, they're helpless, but they are receptive. They are needy, they are helpless, but they are receptive. You know, I think one of the greatest, really the best things about a little child is of all creatures called human, a little child knows better than any how to receive a gift. Do you know, do you know what I mean by that? A little child, better than any of the rest of us, they know how to receive a gift. If I were to uh, kind of walk down from here, and I don't have my checkbook with me, thank goodness, so I can't make good on the illustration. But, but if I had it, and I just took out my checkbook and started writing out $1,000 checks and just handing them out to every one of you here, $1,000 check from Paul Larson to you, 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 just hand them out. You, you know, I, I wonder what would be going through your minds, all of you. You know, in cartoons, they have those little thought clouds that are over their head, and you can read the mind. I, I bet I could read the mind of what would be going through your mind if I was handing out $1,000 checks. Inside your little thought bubbles would be going things like, I'm not sure that it's real. You might be saying, I wonder what he wants. What's he after? What do I have got? What, what's, the, what's the catch? You might say, 
I don't think he's got that much. You might say, what are they paying the new president? I, I don't know what you mean. We say, we have all of these thoughts, all of these things, but if I was to take my sum absolute wealth, which isn't a lot, but take everything that I have, if I was to take back my kids' inheritance, everything that I have minimally saved for them, if I was to take all of my resources and I go to the littlest child in this church, a baby, and want to dump all of that into their savings account, they would look at me and go, sure. It's the easiest thing in the world to give a little child a gift because there is no sense of any understanding that it's anything but a gift. They are totally receptive. You know, a little child never gets a gift and has its immediate thought of being, what are you after? What do I owe you? You know, gift giving in America is kind of, I mean, its own unique sport kind of thing. Like somebody's birthday party, uh, your birthday party, somebody gives you a gift and you look at it and you think, wow, I never got a gift from them before. And what, what comes to your mind? Now you think, now when it's their birthday, you got to give them a gift, right? How much did they spend? 25 bucks? Well, maybe I could get by for 20. No, you know, whatever. But, but we have this thing of, it's not even gifts, really. But not for a little child. A little child never says, what do I owe you? One of the best things about a child is their ability to be given a gift and just passively, without effort or condition, receive it. Now, one last thing we might point out about a child in this story. Little children are needy. They're helpless. They're receptive. But the last thing I'd point out is, in Jesus' eyes, they have a unique capacity to unreservedly trust. A little child... In Jesus' eyes, in this story, has the unique capacity to unreservedly trust. And, and it's not like a capacity for something they do. It's more of a capacity for something they don't do. Here are little children brought to the arms of Jesus, and he just holds them. He just enfolds his arms around them. I, I, I love the double double emphasis uh, in, in the scriptures emphasizing this. Did you notice it in verse 16? It says, what, what does it say? And he took, can you get to verse 16? Find, find where that is somewhere there. Poor person trying to keep up with me on slides. In verse 16, it says, and he took the children in his arms. Do you ever wonder why the verse doesn't end there? Because the point's been made, right? He took the, he took the children in his arms. But that added phrase is there that he put his hands on them. This second expression, he took the children in his arms and he put his hands on them. It, it's almost like, you, you know, those of you that are grandparents or, or parents, when a, when a little one, you're holding a little one and a little child just chooses to kind of just nuzzle into you. And, and you know what that feeling is like when a child just is, is being held and you put your arms uh, around that child and they just nuzzle in and, and you put a, you know, another hand around. If you were an octopus and had eight arms, you'd put them all around because it's just kind of that moment of holding a child that is giving, them, giving themselves and trusting themselves. And we, we kind of sense that Jesus took the children in his arms and he put his hands on them. Good people of word of life in this is a picture, maybe the simplest picture, the simplest expression of saving faith, and it is this. It is just being held. It is just being held. It is just resting in the care of Jesus and entrusting oneself to being held. Did these little children intellectually fathom all that was happening to them? No. Could they come up here and sing worship songs about it? No. Could they write a testimony about it and give it at the Inspiration Point, you know, campfire the last night, which is a great thing? No. Couldn't do that yet. But was there this minimum restriction that they had to have this certain level of maturity or understanding in order for the blessing of Jesus to come to them and be held? No, there was not that restriction. They were held. They rested there. They entrusted themselves to the one that was holding them. Yes, they did. Any one of you have had a, who have had a little child in your arms lean into you 
and let you hold them. Understand this very most basic expression and picture of trust. So, here we go. I have just a few minutes left. Little children need Jesus. They're needy. They're helpless. They're receptive. And they have a unique capacity to unreservedly trust. But now I have to tell you something. This story is not really about little children. It's about us. I know it talks about little children, but this story is really about us. That's the point of the story. Little children are just the picture, are the window for us to understand how Jesus sees us as adults. This picture is, this, this text is a story where Jesus is telling us what we are really like. Big people. And so if this message is that little children need Jesus, you know what? There's a message that says certainly big people need Jesus. That's why Jesus says anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. The point is not the little child. The point is the anyone. It's you and me. Because we need to be brought into the kingdom of God. We need to be saved. We have sin that needs forgiven. We have distance between us and a holy God that needs to be reconciled. We need to be brought into the kingdom of God, a way of saying we need to be placed in a right relationship with God. We need it. We're needy. Also unavoidably inferred here, secondly, is that like little child, we must come to or be reduced to the place of childlike helplessness. Repentance is the New Testament word that the epistles give us, that Jesus gives us, that John the Baptist gives us to tell us how God works by his word through the Holy Spirit to take big people and reduce them down to the helplessness of a little child. Repentance is what takes a person here and brings them here to helplessness. You know, it's intriguing to me what frames this story of Jesus and children. In Luke chapter 18, what comes right before Jesus and the kids is this parable Jesus tells about this very religious person and this notorious sinner, both who go up to the temple to pray. And if you remember, very, very quickly, the first guy prays a prayer like, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I don't, you know, smoke, drink, or date girls that do, or, you know, what, what are that stuff. I'm, I thank you, God, that I'm not like that awful sinner over there, that bum over there. I am a good person. I am far on the east side of the human bell curve of morality and goodness. I even fast twice a week. I even tithe, all these things. But the other guy at the temple, this notorious sinner, this awful sinner, stands in a corner as far away from the the holy place as he can from the altar. He can't even lift up his head. He's desperate. He pounds his chest and he says, God, I am broken. I am empty. I am helpless. I have nothing to bring to you. And Jesus says, that's the one who said, Father, forgive me. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says, that's the guy that went home justified that day. And in the intro line to the parable in Luke, preceding this of Jesus and the children, Luke says, who was Jesus' target audience, he says it was to those who were confident in their own righteousness. It was to those who think that they had this line of minimum qualification and they had met it. Little children. Jesus says, I'm telling you this parable, I'm telling you this story of a righteous guy who thinks he has met the line and someone who knows he hasn't. He says, I'm telling this story to people who are confident in their own righteousness and they need to know that it's not enough. They're not the ones going home justified. Very quickly here in Matthew and Mark, just before the story of Jesus and the little children, Jesus is teaching about hard hearts. Jesus is teaching about people who kind of have a puffed up chest and says, I qualify. He teaches about divorce and he says behind every divorce, hearts were hard. It's very interesting, if you go further back, there's this pattern in in Mark. Mark chapter 9, leading up to this text in Mark chapter 10, really is showing us 
time and again that the disciples really aren't very good with kids. You know, some people are good with kids. The disciples weren't very good with kids. In Mark chapter 9, the, the chapter before, if you go back, there's this story of this boy. Do you remember he was possessed by an evil spirit? Do you know the story I'm talking about? Uh, Jesus is off in the distance, and he comes back, and some of his disciples are arguing with the religious leaders uh, there. And he says, what, he comes on there, and he says, why were you arguing? And, and the people say, well, we asked your disciples to, to throw the demon out of this, this boy, and, and they couldn't. Do you remember how it proceeds? Here is this little child, and, and Jesus delivers this little child from the demon possession. But when Jesus talks to the father, he says, how long has he been like this? Do you remember the father's answer? It says, since he was a little child. And, and I pondered that story a few times, and I thought, you know, we live in such a rationalistic world, such a minimum qualification, minimum restriction kind of world. We see something here that's it's just a tragedy to think that we think otherwise. How can we ever come to the place of think that, a, that an evil spirit can indwell a little baby but say that the Spirit of God can't? Really? Do we want to say that? How could we say that the devil could have a baby but Jesus couldn't? You see the point I'm making? The, the disciples can't imagine that. And then after that, in Mark chapter 9, they go on and they're arguing, the disciples now, about who's the greatest. And once again, Jesus takes a little child and he puts him in, this, in the middle and he, again, he puts his arms uh, on him and he uses that child as a, as a model of, of greatness. And so that's what comes before the story of Jesus and the children. But afterward, all three gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all go into telling the story of this nice, moral, spiritually pious, young, upper-class man. We call him the rich young ruler. Right after Jesus is with the kids saying, if any of you want to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be like a child. And up comes running this young, rich young ruler, and he must have missed the childlike lesson. The guy seems humble, but he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus has to say, nothing, nothing. So people, here's where it hits home and where I end. Because certainly maybe inside your heart you have asked the question, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And Jesus says to you, maybe like the rich young ruler, he knows exactly the place that you're depending upon your own righteous, righteousness. In the rich young ruler's stead, it was his money, and so he said, go and sell everything you have. What is the thing that you're depending on to be right with God? Jesus is challenging that this morning and saying, if you think you're going to be right with God by measuring up to the certain bar, you are wrong. If you are going to enter the kingdom of heaven today, it is because by repentance, God brings you to the place of helplessness and neediness and the place to receive the gift of faith that will connect you to the saving work of Jesus of what Jesus did for you on the cross. And people, that bar is very, very low. Unless you become, as a little child, admitting your need, your absolute helplessness to save yourself. Unless you become receptive to this gift of faith of just being held by the grace of Jesus, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Lord God, you know the hearts of each person here. You know all the ways in which we make excuse, all the ways that we take pride, all the ways that we say to ourselves, to other people, and even look up to you and say, I meet the requirement. But God, that's a lie. Even our best righteousness are like filthy rags in your sight. God, it's not just the obvious evil things in our life that need to be forgiven. It's our false sense of righteousness. It's our false sense of qualifying that keep us from being right with you. So God, around this room today, I believe that your Holy Spirit is prodding and calling 
and creating repentance and faith where there was not before. Lord Jesus, find in this room hearts that you are speaking to, saying, convicting, and giving a childlike gift of faith to just rest in you and the work of Calvary, to just being held by grace. Lord God, thank you for the salvation that you give to little children like me. Amen.